Good Sunday evening to everybody, uh, and welcome back to episode 44 of Talking TSR. Uh, I am your co-host, Chris, and along to my virtual left is my usual partner in crime, uh, Rick. Rick, say hello to everybody. How's everyone doing? Glad we could join you again. How is it going, Rick? How's everything uh, it's going in, in northern the northern corner of New Jersey? I know. It's been such a mild winter. I can't believe it's the middle of March already. Um, I know. I and more like snow's coming. Sliding through this winter to spring, you know. <laughs> yeah, we're getting more snow in March than we did like in December, January, and February. So it's just another typical winter in New Jersey. Yep. What can we say? Yeah, so. that's it. You're you're never safe until the second week of April. I always say so. Yeah, and we still got a few more weeks to go. Up, oh, cool. People are already popping in the chat. Uh, Shade of Icarus is there. Dice Station Zero. Hello, 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 everybody. Hello. Uh, so this is going to be a little bit of a different show. Um, a couple of uh, announcements to get out of the way, first of all. So um, if you haven't uh, checked out our current Kickstarter, Dungeon Denizens, right now, um, clearly you haven't been watching any of our shows for the last couple of weeks because that's all we've been talking about. Um, and today's tonight's show is themed uh, kind of adjacent to what's going on there. So, um, But uh, um, Elena will drop the link in the chat if folks need to check it out. Uh, we are over 300,000 big ones there, and we've got just over a week to go on the Kickstarter. So we're kind of coming to the home stretch and everything. So uh, folks, give that a give that a, a check out if you haven't already. Um, we have another, our third and final Monster Mash episode is coming up this Thursday night, uh, March 16th, uh, special time, 5 p.m. Um, and this is the DCC RPG version of the Monster Mash, where you're going to meet some of the contributors to the DCC side of the uh, of the book. Um, so definitely going to want to check those out. Um, and one more last announcement. Gary Khan is right around the corner. Gary Khan is March 23rd to 26th in Lake Geneva, Wisconsin, the birthplace of tabletop role-playing games. Yes. Um, and I, I will be attending this year. I've not been to Gary Khan in five years or so. Um, and, uh, you know, We'll have a booth there. Obviously, we'll be running events. Um, you know, come to the booth, stop in. Uh, Mike will be there. I'll be there. Brendan, Jen, Bob. I think Tim is going to make an appearance there and everything. So, mm. sure, I'm missing some folks. I'm sure there's going to be a couple other folks there too. But definitely, if you guys are at GaryCon, uh, please stop by, check it out. You know, talk us up a little bit. Um, it's the whole reason that we go to conventions is to to meet and engage directly with the fans. Um, instead of little boxes on a computer, which which um, seems to be all that more common and everything. So uh, so for tonight, we are going to do our top 10 favorite monster movies, which is a weird topic, agreed. Um, but it fits. Tonight is Oscar night. Yay. Um, so we're talking movies on Oscar night, which is kind of cool. Um, and also, it's kind of like I said, it's kind of monster adjacent and everything. So yeah. So, Rick, why don't you tell us about uh, your high-level view of what is a monster movie and or what's not a monster movie and or uh, how you kind of worked on your list. Sure. Um, <clears throat> and that's that's sort of the $64,000 question, isn't it? Because I Everybody's think here. definitely you're getting the Rick definition here because um, I think there's a thin line there between what's a monster movie and what's i don't know a horror movie or any other kind of kind of movie so when i looked at formating uh you know formulating my list for tonight i tried to think of something where the monster was more centric where the monster monster or monsters definitely are a central role you know definitely drive the action in the movie uh when i think of a monster movie i tend to think non-human I mean, certainly there are human-based monsters, you know, Frankenstein's monster was obviously a classic monster. So I, I don't want to say, you know, it can't be human or, or kind of human. But personally, I think of more uh, monstrous things when I think of monster movies, non-human, you know, aliens or dinosaurs or anything that's not, you know, a, a, a huge grizzly bear, anything that's not, you know, a human. A, a cocaine Hence bear. Yeah. I go um so i my list is sort of coming from that direction um but that said i i have some movies on this list as i mentioned to you in the green room that i think have good monsters in the movie but i don't know if i would call some of these movies monster movies some of them might be fantasy or, or suspense or other things but uh that's where i'm coming from is more just did the movie you know contain some real mon uh, monster 
that I found inspiring or frightening or exciting or different? Uh, and if so, I, I put it on the list. And there's so many more I could have put on this list. So I'll put that caveat in right. I, I think I could have come up with a list triple the size. Um, so this was this was a hard one. This will be fun to see uh, what we come up with and and if we cross over. Yeah, yeah. Well, I already know that you're a pretty big fan of of classic horror movies and mm -hmm. and probably classic horror monster movies. I am not, so my list uh, I think is going to be a little bit more on the eclectic side. Mm -hmm. um, but I agree with you. Um, I'm not sure all these all these movies would be considered monster movies, but they certainly have at least one monster in them. Mm -hmm. um, some of them more. Um, and, uh, I, I kind of tended to gravitate towards movies that, um, kind of had some kind of impact with me when I was growing up. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I was telling you earlier, I think only three of my movies are from the eighties and later, everything mm -hmm. else is seventies and before. And, and those three movies and eighties and later, one is in 1980 and two is in 1981. So, um, we don't get past uh, 81, 1981 on my list, so I did definitely mm -hmm. skew more towards classic, and that's because mm -hmm. that's when I was in my formative years and mm -hmm. first discovering D and D back in the very early 80s. These were the movies I was watching. I mean, mm -hmm. I was watching stuff from the 70s, from the 60s, and the early 80s, and everything. And those are the ones that are probably the really the most impactful ones to me, yeah. um, and the ones that I kind of thought were yeah um this is what i think of monster movies and shade of icarus is already in there with prophecy 1980 the, i've actually seen most of that movie um, giant that was a, mutated bear <laughs> yeah that was a freaky movie that was a yeah. that was a that was a i remember again i don't think i watched the whole thing but i i, I think that was uh that was a, a pretty freaky one so i remember um, that i might have even yeah. seen it in the theater i remember a sort of wow. you know monster movie with a background environmental message you know they they tried to they tried to slip the you know environmental message in with the monster in that yeah this is off topic but do you remember the first movie you saw in a movie theater oh the first movie the ever? very first movie any movie you've ever that you do that you remember seeing uh, in a movie theater do you even not really i could tell you like the first science fiction movie i ever saw or that kind of thing maybe but the first okay. movie ever i honestly couldn't tell you uh, um mine was meatballs I saw really meatballs. yeah meatballs in an airplane right after that or oh, shortly after funny. that or something yeah but yeah meatballs I don't know why I saw meatballs in the theater but that's the early Bill Murray I yeah. mean yeah so um that's classic. like my first science fiction movie I don't know why I remember that was 2001 um, okay okay that wasn't the first time it came out I think it was like coming back around you know it, it yeah, was like yeah, years later true. you know occasionally they would kind of re-release things into the theater and it was so it, it certainly wasn't when it first hit the theater yeah but um i remember you know sitting in the movie theater with my parents kind of heady stuff of all things to see 2001 as your first outing i, I definitely uh, yeah uh, know, definitely i mean star there's... wars was a relief after that but yeah uh, i for some reason that sticks in my head it's funny okay all right so well i mean unless you have anything else to add to that we we have 10 we have a top 10 list tonight so we've got quite a bit to go through and we each sure. have i think we each have three honorable mentions so yeah. uh let's let's kind of whip through the honorable mentions kind of quickly um each of us do you want to do you want to go first and do all three of your honorable mentions or do you want to go back and forth on the honorable mentions how do you, you want to do this let's have some fun let's go back and forth okay all right cool so do you want to go first or you want me to uh i'll go first why not okay go um ahead. My first honorable mention is a 1954 movie called Them with an exclamation mark. This was a movie basically about giant ants, you know, radiation yeah. or nuclear waste or something made the ants big. I can't also remember, um, except the ants were just sort of running around and it was your classic, you know, there was a lot of these movies in the 50s. Something made big, Yep. you know, colossal, uh, you know. And this one, I remember seeing at a young age, and it really affected me. I thought the ants were scary. They made this sort of noise. I think Leonard Nimoy, you know, a very young Leonard Nimoy even had some sort of bit part in this movie. But I just remember the ants, and there was a lot of them, and this sound they made. And, you know, there were scenes where the humans were, you know, in the caves, and the kind of the ants were marching on them. And it was it was pretty formative. Um, and it harks my very first D and D experience, which was in search of the unknown. And I encountered a giant ant. And of course, you know, giant ants aren't them size, but 
me having them as my only reference yeah you know my the novice dm gave me one giant ant at first level and i assumed the thing was as big as a houseboat <laughs> <laughs> so i was That's like awesome. i run you know kind of thing and it's just it's funny now for me to think of my first encounter my fighter basically running for the hills at the side of a giant ant that was probably nice. the size of you know That's a, cool. a rottweiler or something but it, it is what it is so that's cool anyway first okay. honorable mention them all right my first honorable mention is one of the what i would say classic horror movies on my list even though it didn't really make my list this is uh the mummy uh but this mm. is the 1959 the mummy this is the peter cushing christopher lee one this was the one that i stumbled across this one Probably 15 years ago, um, I think it was on regular TV or it might have been, I don't know, on Amazon Prime or something like that. But um, uh, I got sucked into the dialogue of this movie. Um, mm -hmm. Not not so much the monster part of it, but um, I ended up watching the entire movie and I just got I was like, like on the edge of my seat, just the tension in the room with the dialogue and everything. And, I, and, and spoiler alert, uh, Peter Cushing's going to show up on my list <laughs> at least one more time um and probably in in movies you will not expect mm. um but uh you know uh but anyway so like i said the mummy was kind of secondary to this now you know i did think about throwing the you know the the brendan fraser mummy movies on there because mm. they did have the scarab beetles and yeah, the half scorpion. yeah. i mean the rock is a half scorpion half man yeah. was i mean I, I know the special effects were cheesy but it was cool to see that on a on a big screen and everything and the 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 anubis uh warriors turning to sand and everything and and yeah. of course the mummy and all that i thought about it but i i didn't go there just not no room so so my honorable mention number three is the 1959 the mummy nice it's hard to go wrong with peter cushing you know it is. It let's is be honest wrong. or lee for that matter or any of the like if you the harama movies they did so good true Totally agree. And I didn't even think of The Mummy, honestly. I love the Brendan, uh, Brendan Fraser Mummy movies. Mm -hmm. so at least too. the first two. Third yeah. one. Yeah, yeah third and, one. And coming, yeah. Yeah. The Tom Cruise remake, we do not speak about. We do not. We, do not. we move on. We move on. <laughs> All right. So my, my next honorable mention um, is 1990. So I'm going a little closer to, to okay. home. Uh, Tremors. The okay, Boy. yeah. I thought These about this. Just, a, yeah. you know, totally obviously fun you know tongue in your cheek have fun movie uh where you know they kind of did the jaws thing on land and it was just a lot of fun but they actually kind of had a very well realized creature you know this mm -hmm. burring worm that absolutely could be something i could picture in a D, &D game you know yeah. as some sort of cousin to the purple worm so i had to throw that in there it didn't quite make the list uh, but it had an impact. It's something that still brings okay. a smile to my face when it comes around. So, yeah. and it's funny you mentioned that. So last week we did the uh, backers were uh, participating in various polls to create a monster, and it was definitely skewing toward a burrowing worm like mm. uh, something that could swallow or constrict or something kind of thing. And there was a lot of tremors talk in the chat and mm. um, in the comments about that. So yeah, so that's i i could i could see that nice so that, no that's a good one that's that's yeah because was a, they were what did they end up with the psycho worm or something? yeah the, uh, a cerebral cerebral lurker is lurker the, okay the, yeah so interesting nice so, so um okay my uh, second honorable mention uh so uh you guys i think know most of the the folks out there understand i'm a huge mystery science theater <laughs> 3000 fan uh so i had to put the ator movies on this list um you know there was four i didn't even realize there's four apparently there's two other ones i need to see out there um and uh, although apparently the, the the third and the fourth really kind of went off the off the rails a little bit they're all in the 80s though 1982 is a tour which was also if you watch the mst version um uh actually it was a tour the fighting eagle was the american version and then the second movie was the one that um that they mst the first time around but anyway uh giant spiders giant snakes demonesses uh that beguile you um invisible guards or invisible whatever they were you couldn't see them which was kind of uh hilarious and um yeah neanderthals there you know they it had it had monsters in it um again i seriously considered like going back to reviewing all the mst movies ever done and i could have probably come up with a tidy top 10 list from those 
I can't guarantee that there won't be another couple on there, but I did not do that. I have non-MST movies as well. So that's my second honorable mention. The Ator movies. Let's go with Ator the Fighting Eagle as a default. <laughs> there you go. All right. My last uh, honorable mention, and purely for just a whacked out creature design that stuck in my mind. Um, and this is one of these fly below the radar movies, I think, for some people, was uh, Attack the Block 2011. Uh, this was basically a movie about gang members that have to hold off an apartment block against these just crazy looking aliens. Basically, they were pitch black fur with neon fangs, neon blue fangs. And <laughs> the movie even featured a young, I'm going to screw up his name, from The Force Awakens, John Bo Bodega. Bode um, oh, Bo Boyega. Boyega. Yeah. Um, yeah, he he plays, I think, the gang leader. I haven't seen the movie in quite a while, but uh, if you want to see him in something when he's very young. Uh, but yeah, just a cool movie, crazy, interesting monster design. So I'm just I just want to give props to uh, Attack the Block for something. Right. That when you see those monsters, they definitely will stick in your head for a little bit. Nice. Awesome. And my final honorable mention is I'm going to go there. Um, the Hobbit. And I'm not I'm not going Lord of the Rings because I actually think The Hobbit had better, more classic critters. And I'm going to go with the 1977 Rankin Bass animated Hobbit. Nice. Um, just because I think that was better done. Um, but yeah, trolls, goblins, wargs, a werebear, spiders, giant eagles, of course, Slog mm -hmm. the Dragon. I mean, yeah, I mean, it just it, it kind of had everything. I mean, you know, and it doesn't get any more tropey than that. Um, and like I said, there was definitely some cool creatures in the Lord of the Rings trilogy, but I, I think I, I'd like to stick with The Hobbit just because I think the creatures are a little bit more classic. Mm -hmm. um, I honestly argued about putting this one on my list, keeping it off the list, but I figured, well, it sounded like a good honorable mention. <laughs> so nice. so that's where I ended up with with that one. So that was, that's my third honorable mention. I love those animated movies. I have to be oh, honest. The awesome. animated Lords of yeah. the Lord of the Rings movies, which I include The Hobbit as part of that, were wonderful. Love yeah. them. Yeah, and and have and Peter Jackson used them yeah. as inspiration. Yeah. There are some oh, scenes yeah. that are almost exactly yeah, both both from Lord of the Rings and from that. I mean, definitely you can, in you fellowship. Can see the, there's yeah, you, know. you can see the homage there. Yeah, absolutely. All right, so we're back to me. All right, yep. so my number, number 10. ten. Here we go. Definitely a formative movie for me uh, when I was young. Nineteen thirty three, King Kong. Wow! Wow! Um, wow! what an impression this made on me as a youth the um the stop motion animation you know in this case uh not harryhausen but willis o'brien um the t-rex battle is something i always remember it just blew my mind as a kid i wanted a t-rex armature for the longest time i think i'd buy one now if i could find a place to get one <laughs> uh you know it took o'brien like seven weeks to film that you know, just by by moving things, and I even this movie even caused me as a as a, as a youth to make eight millimeter movies of my own and do wow. my own stop motion and animation. And I would run around the neighborhood and basically Shanghai any neighborhood kids I could into my production and constantly nice. making these more elaborate productions. I remember taping transparent tubes to the side of some kid's face and pumping blood up there and shooting it from the other side wow. so it was like special effects and blowing up models and my poor parents i was always exploding spaceship models in the backyard and filming it but yeah it, it was like it started me on this whole kind of crazy thing and then eventually the filmmaking kind of turned to writing because i just found writing was frankly easier to get you know insane things you could just it was a whole lot easier to write them than <laughs> to try to build them um so a lot of me being a writer and doing what i do now came from this movie so there's no way i couldn't put it on my list anyway king kong nice. solid number 10 all right my number 10 well folks you know i'm a star wars fan so i had to put star wars on there <laughs> i mean i could not not put star wars on there um, I thought about not putting it on there, but then I put it on there anyway. Um, and I'm going to go, if I have to pick one, I'm going to go Empire Strikes Back because mm -hmm. I think the, the the beasties in Empire Strikes Back were more important. They weren't just little glimpses and kind of hear something and not really important everything. You had the Tauntaun, which got a lot of 
I mean, we saw the insides of the damn thing, not only the outsides <laughs> of it. So um, that got a lot of screen time. Uh, the Wampa, obviously, in the extended editions, we got a lot more screen time. And I know they wanted a lot more. And there's that awesome story about how the Rebel base, they actually had a room full of Wampas um, that were imprisoned. And, you know, and C-3PO rips the, the warning sign off. And then the stormtroopers blunder into that room and everything. And there's there's like footage of, of that and everything, which hmm. is cool. Uh, the space slug. Who could forget the space oh, yeah. slug? Um, which is awesome. Um, and and even the Minox. I mean, yep. chewing on the power cables. Love love the Minox. Every time when I was writing Star Wars adventures back in the day, I always used to try and get Minox in there somewhere. <laughs> there's always an assassin droid, and there's always some Minox somewhere. Um, I really really wanted to um, put the Mandalorian in there, but then I then I came to my senses and said, oh, whoops, that's TV. That's not a movie, even though it feels like a movie. <laughs> mm -hmm. But, you know, we're not like five minutes into the first season, episode one of the Mandalorian, and you've got that walrus dragon creature breaking through the ice and attacking the ship. Um, you know, uh, uh, the premiere episode of season two, the crate dragon, which was amazing, the mud horn um we even got bullywugs in season two um and so i mean star wars has a very very solid foundation of always mm -hmm. putting some some crazy critters in there um yeah. and uh and i had to actually kind of you know pay um homage to that and just because they you know it was a a, a fa you know lucas loved it and it's a mm -hmm. tradition that they've kind of carried on um, so I had to do that. So that was my number 10. That's why I kind of slotted it in the number 10. Mm -hmm. I figured let's get it out of the way early. <laughs> let's, <laughs> let's just, you know, just get it out of the way, get it out there. Um, and then move on to some, you know, what I consider to be, you know, some more serious yeah. picks or whatever you want to call it. So my yeah. number 10, we'll say empire strikes back 1980. Good, 1980. good solid pick. Um, and for the record, at least one of the stars movies almost made my list. Cause I agree. Just so many cool creature designs. I'll always remember the slug creature. Yeah. And even some characters are almost like Jabba the Hutt are almost yeah. like monsters given personality. So there's just a lot of good stuff there. All right. My number nine. And I raised this on our holiday show. If people remember as a possible gift. Um, again, kind of something that struck me in my youth. Golden Voyage of Sinbad. Uh Obviously, I wouldn't call it a monster movie per se, more, you know, fantasy movie or something along those lines, uh, kids movie, whatever you want to call it, but terrific monsters in here. Certainly D&D, &D, you know, uh, inspiration material in this movie. You've got a Cyclops slash Centaur in here. You have a Griffin. You've got an animated statue with six arms. You've got homunculuses. You've got all kinds of critters in this movie and and the same goes for the other sinbad movies I, I think there's always this duel between people who like the seventh voyage and the people who like the golden voyage i'm a golden voyage guy but both movies obviously it's like star wars all the movies have critters in them you know and great again yeah. stop motion animation which i love so yeah that's an easy number nine for me like you said kind of to get it out of the way uh just to <laughs> say you know all right sinbad i mentioned it gone we'll go to more you know obscure stuff maybe <laughs> <laughs> so. awesome <clears throat> very cool um okay my number nine debatable whether or not this one's a monster movie or not um certainly doesn't have a lot of monsters in it but the one monster that is in it um you know steals the show is the most important part of the show and um you know this this was a very uh formative movie for me this is 1981's dragon slayer mm. um you know it's only got the one the one monster the dragon um, enough, and, though. <laughs> and the baby dragons but it was really um it, it was it was all about the dragon and you know obviously being you know finding D, D literally that year and again i didn't see it in the theater so i didn't see it probably for two or three more years after that probably when i was i probably saw 84 85 probably whenever it hit the, the west coast video in my town um you know uh so I don't know exactly when I saw it, but that's but when I did see it, 8045, that's when I was playing DD like nonstop. Mm -hmm. And and to see something like that and to see a dragon literally come mm -hmm. alive. Um and and now to even even and again, it's a the movie is is it the best movie in the world? Heck no. Um, but again, there's an awesome dragon in it. And mm -hmm. and just just to see that, you know, Lake on Fire and the dragon. Yeah um you know the rest of it it's, it's kind of slow it's plotting at times it's uh, confusing at times uh, also you know really kind of you know 
you really wonder if in third edition, if they, where they got their idea of like the whole sorcerer background with the whole fact that they're tied into dragons and everything. Um, I thought that was kind of fascinating too. So, um, and I loved it. Uh, had a young uh, Ian McDermott in it, who mm. uh, was 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 Emperor Palpatine. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, so that was that was kind of cool. But it was definitely like all about dragon, and I was just 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 amazed at how lifelike the dragon was. Mm -hmm. um, you know, just it just blew my mind um, that they could do something like that and really set the bar for yeah. for that. And you know, still to this day. You know, I think dragon movies are trying to 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 do a one up on that. I mean, we've come a long way with Throne of uh, uh, Game of Thrones and all those mm -hmm. things. But anyway, still just a, a great one. So my number nine, Dragon Slayer. Nice. I I think that was definitely one of the earliest movies or the earliest movie in my mind to really depict the power and kind of majesty of dragons. You know, in D&D, &D, we kind of mention them casually, and I think players don't always think of, you know, why they have that fear effect or how big yeah. or powerful or formidable dragons are. And then there are a few rare movies of which I think Dragon Slayer is one. Certainly Lord of the Rings with the smog. And then mm -hmm. I think, yeah, Game of Thrones, like I'm currently watching. I'm slow. I'm currently watching Game of Thrones, and we're in the seventh season where you finally see oh. some real dragon attacks. I'm sorry to hear that. that you're on yeah, the <laughs> we're catching up. But uh some of the dragon attacks that are taking place at this point where I'm watching Game of Thrones are really things where I'm looking and I'm saying to my friend next to me, this is why dragons are cool. You know, this is why yeah. dragons are to be feared. So, but Dragon Slayer was certainly the first. So, uh, yeah, props to that pick. All right, where are we? Number eight. eight. All right, here, here we're definitely going into horror movie category, uh, territory to be sure. Um, 2005, I think this is my most recent movie. Uh, this will probably be the least known movie on this list, I think. The Descent. This was basically uh -huh. uh, a bunch of ladies go on, you know, a spelunking adventure and they run into and they call them crawlers, basically these sort of subterranean humanoids. And they're depicted over two movies, actually, very realistically. They have large ears. They don't have as good eyesight. They're very, you know, grungy looking, but they're sort of pale because they've been underground and they're just very well realized. And to me, this movie, it's it's great to watch if you're thinking of like D and D humanoids, if you're thinking of subterranean humanoids or something, because here you have a movie that very realistically depicts, you know, what you know, goblins or something like that could look like. Mm -hmm. um, and seeing this movie, I guess about ten years ago or something, when I finally saw it, it helps me now when i think of creature designs and humanoid designs i i think of the crawlers and i think all right you know this is where you start you start with the real and you work it out from there so uh yeah a little bit under the radar but i'm going to put on my list as a number eight the descent all right so my um my number eight uh is a little bit on the off the wall side i would say uh, it is um, 1976's At the Earth's Core. Mm. Um, so this was the uh, Peter Cushing again. He's mm -hmm. showing up on my list a lot here. Uh, truly, you can see the range of the actor because he plays a bumbling scientist in this one and nowhere near <laughs> um, Graham off Tarkin at all or, or or the role that he played in, in The Mummy. But um, but this one, again, a little bit off the wall. Now, I did recently see the MST version of this movie, and it brought back all of the memories um, <laughs> because they redid it, I think, in I think the season in 2016 or 2017. But I remember watching this movie, um, and I think it was the Sunday night movie or maybe the Friday night movie. It was probably 1977, 78, whenever it came to network tv i remember being so excited about this seeing the the drill going through the ground and everything and then they pop up and then all the weird critters and everything um so i i, I remember, honestly this is one of those movies i remember when i was a kid of the anticipation of waiting for it to come on tv i don't know how i heard about it i don't know why i knew about it i probably read about it in the tv guide back in the day but i remember just being just already there i think it was a friday night at eight o'clock i and i was gonna you know i was gonna stay awake for this thing um and you know watch it to the end and all that so it, that's part of the reason why I, I put it on my list um but you know and you know you had the you had the mahars or the the mahars whatever you want to call it the um the the pterodactyl like psionic 
things, which would be just perfect in DCC. Uh, the Sagoth, which are kind of like the orcs that are enslaving the Neanderthals and the cavemen. The Fire Lizard. The Fire Lizard, I mean, when I saw that Fire Lizard, I mean, I honestly was like, that's the Fire Lizard from the Monster Manual. I mean, mm -hmm. it's like exactly the Fire Lizard from the Monster Manual. It's a big lizard that breathes fire. It's not a dragon. It's just a big lizard that, that breathes fire. <laughs> um, and that, that you know, just that kind of all brought in you know, Doug McClure. I mean, which I always thought Troy McClure from the, the Simpsons was this guy. Because I was like, oh, Doug McClure. I'm like, no, apparently nothing to do with him. But. But yeah, so this this movie really, I, I I remember the anticipation of it back in the the, the late seventies probably. Um, but yeah, and it was just it was it was it was silly, it was wonky, but damn, there were some cool critters in it, and it definitely stayed with me uh, for a long long time. So, but I think I actually saw the movie before I started playing D and D, so probably planted those early seeds. You know, mm -hmm. hey, I would like more of this. I want to tell stories like this. So, so my number eight at the Earth's core. The nice. regular version, the MST version is pretty good too. <laughs> and now you're telling those stories. So see? Yes. All right. So my number seven, I think people watching may have heard of this movie. Um, the Lord of the Rings, Fellowship of the Ring, uh, Peter Jackson. Uh, I had to put one of these movies on there, but this one I think was an easy pick because we have the first introduction of the Nazgul, which I think are just such frightening Mm -hmm. Again, something that in D and D terms you could think of as far as rats or many things, you know, um, just very frightening critters. And and then you had other, you know, cool critters too. You had the Watcher in the Water, and 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 you had the the Balrog for that matter. Um, yeah. Ogres, you know, their realization of ogres, the the very kind of monstrous depiction of goblins, and you know, crawling up the pillars, and just just one cool monster type of thing after another. Uh, so it's hard not, and yet realistic. So it's hard not to put this on here and, and definitely, you know, not a horror movie or not a monster movie, but to be sure, a fantasy movie that includes some just fabulous monster designs. Um, and again, the Nazgul in particular. And like you, I kind of harken back to my first seeing them in the animated version before, which, as we discussed, sort of inspired Jackson, you know, in a lot of his scenes very directly for this. So it, they're just as creepy in the animated, frankly, when they're kind of stalking the hobbits and the you know hobbits are hiding under a tree and the Nazgul are kind of passing around. And you hear this ominous music. Uh, it was kind of almost frightening for a cartoon. So definitely made a mark on me. So, yeah, number lucky seven will give up to Lord of the Rings, Fellowship of the Ring. Nice, excellent. So, and Shade of Icarus with the comment, "Holy moly, just watched this on Friday <laughs> in anticipation of the show." I'm um, pretty sure he's referring to um, at the Earth's core on that. So, yes, nice. Was yeah. it the regular version or was it the MST version? <laughs> the question, so. um, all right, my number seven. Um, I had to put a kaiju theme mm -hmm. in there. You know, uh, movie. Probably not the one everybody's going to expect. I it could have been easy. I could have went Godzilla, but I didn't because I like my big, huge, giant movie monsters, dudes in rubber suits to be filled with turtle meat. So <laughs> I went with I went with Gamera. Um, I, nice. Again, I, I re the Gamera movies. I remember watching them. Um, I think it was like after school, probably in the seventies. For some reason. I think I watched more Gamera movies than Godzilla movies. I mean, I always mm -hmm. knew about Godzilla, um, but I think I watched the sillier Godzilla movies and Gamera was was silly and kind of out there too, but I definitely remember them. And then obviously mm -hmm. um, the Gamera movies have had the full MST treatment. Um, so I've revisited them since then, but I've, I've watched, I've even watched some of the newer Gamera movies. And, I, and when I talk to Gamera movies, I'm talking the, the Gamera movies from the 60s and the early 70s. Um, and just amazing that they could put out a, a movie a year. They started with Gamera in 65, mm -hmm. and then there was one in 66, 67, 68, 69, 70, and 71. I mean, that is amazing. I get it. It's a dude in, in a rubber suit, and it's models, and they're just walking around, and there's a lot of times not even a whole lot of dialogue in the movies, but but they're just so much fun. Mm -hmm. Um, And um, I really, yeah, I, I just wanted to, I, I had to, I had to get one in there, 
So, um, so I had to slide in like the Gamera franchise from the late mm -hmm. 60s, early 70s. Um, not so much the the later ones, even though I know Gamera is alive and well and still doing you know, movies, and so is Godzilla for that matter too. Mm. So, um, so that's it. My number seven, the Gamera IP franchise, whatever you want to call it. I I love those movies. I, I'll be honest. The only entry I have in that kind of genre is the, my earlier King Kong. Okay. I don't have, yeah. But love the Gamera movies. Love the Godzilla movies. You know. Uh, I was a huge Ghidorah fan and uh, I even enjoyed Pacific Rim. Honestly, I, I, you know, again, with, with thumb, you know, tongue firmly rammed in cheek. Uh, I enjoyed the heck out of Pacific Rim. Actually. I felt like I was a little kid watching basically Godzilla again when I went to see that in the theater. So, yeah, you know, props to that. So yeah, definitely. They definitely have their place. Um, all right. Here's an unusual pick, but you never know. Um okay. 1993 uh jurassic park Not i, I a... gave it serious consideration you, yeah i really did i kind of wanted to i kind of wanted to go there because i agree with you is it a monster movie probably not but it's a dinosaur movie and, right. and you know when we were kids dinosaur movies were monster movies i mean and and in this the dinosaurs I mean, I mean, again, the way I think of like, I guess, horror movies in general is horror movies usually imply usually have a threat. That's the whole point. Yep. The threat is more often than not caused by a monster, be it humorous mm -hmm. or otherwise, mm -hmm. you know, or, I mean, uh, human or otherwise, it, it's usually a monster driving the threat. And in this case, the dinosaurs basically want to eat everybody. So uh certainly scary. I just I still remember my brother in law going out to see this before I did coming to me like a gog with a slight excitement because he knows i like dinosaurs anyway and telling me he just and going to me and basically saying rick spielberg has dinosaurs he said to yeah. me you yeah. know? <laughs> and told me to go see it and the depiction of the t-rex and and yeah. this sam winston just knocked it out of the park and and the the velociraptors with the kitchen scene you know obviously yeah. now still famous still holds up when you think it, it's incredible that's 1993 how old yeah. the movie is and it's i saw it re again recently and it still holds up yeah it's still good you know yeah there's some better things maybe effect wise now but i mean it holds up incredibly well and the, the kitchen scene is just such a good frightening scene because they take a creature that was essentially real with a few little liberties and they really make it scary yeah. and again it's it's something too where you say to your uh you know players oh you see some you know six foot dinosaurs oh, who cares you know but then you tell them to watch a scene or two in Jurassic Park and then go back to the table and roll the dice and think about it. And they might think about it a little differently, totally. the kind of threat a dinosaur can pose. So for that, easy number six, Jurassic Park. All right. All right. Um, my number six is definitely a crossover with you, King Kong. Mm. I mean, I had to go King Kong. Yeah. Um, ironically, uh, well, not ironically, uh, not so much the 1933 version. I okay. grew up on the 76 version. That was the one that came to TV and I kind of related with. I also seem to remember around Thanksgiving. I think it was the day after Thanksgiving. They used to do basically like a King Kong uh, marathon on one of the channels. They used to do like Mighty Joe Young. I, think I was going to say, yeah, Mighty Joe Young. Always yeah, Mighty Joe play. Young. Yep. Uh, yeah, they they played like all of the King Kong movies. Yeah. In that. And I think yep. and I fondly remember that. I remember always watching those, um, uh, you know, and I remember specifically, I believe it was the Friday after Thanksgiving. I think I think James mm -hmm. Bond eventually took over that marathon niche later on when it was always <laughs> Bond movies were always played around the Thanksgiving holiday after that. But but no, I mean, so I grew up on uh, the 76 version with young Jeff Bridges. Um, I will give some serious props to the 2005 uh, Peter Jackson version. Mm -hmm. That T-Rex scene was oh, yeah. over the top, over the yeah. top. Um, but it was over the top in a good way. I mean, yeah. it was like Made so with off the wall that it was just so enjoyable. Just mm -hmm. definitely just, just you know, and then there was the, the cave with the giant insects that Peter Jackson did and everything. Mm -hmm. I mean, I mean, I thought he, there were, there were parts of the movie I did not like, obviously, but there were, there were parts of the movie he clearly got to. Oh yeah. yeah. Um, without a doubt. And it was a, a great homage. So I would say the 1976 King Kong, definitely back to the roots of 33, but you know, 76 is the one I grew up on. So that's the one I'm going to kind of, kind of, home in on so my number six nice definite crossover with rick king kong nice and yeah i really enjoyed actually jackson's king kong 
yeah. again, because I felt like the man's love for the movie showed in that same yeah. way that some yep. filmmakers like uh, Quentin Tarantino kind of show their love of yeah. movies, classic yep. movies and yep. what they do. Jackson, absolutely, you know, like you said, is every part of it great? No. But yeah. uh, did it have some wild monster scenes? Absolutely. Yep. So, yep. yeah. All right. Well, now we're going to get a little more classic. My number five. Okay. Uh, 1958 though it had a really good 19 a really really good 1988 remake if that's a big hint mm. uh the blob steve mcqueen mm. um your first real kind of solid representation of an ooze creature or blob kind of you know classic D D kind of you know blob a meteor crashes and lets out this blob and it just keeps eating people and getting bigger and it keeps becoming a bigger and bigger threat and you know the whole movie kind of is about almost like these these youngsters that stumble into this thing and you know it's a like a boy cried wolf thing where the adults don't necessarily take them seriously until it's too late and this thing's wrecking havoc and the 1958 followed the same kind of general procedure but made the blob even more horrifying because you saw it dissolving flesh and kind of melting people away in a very gelatinous cubey sort of way so uh yeah a movie too that uh, seeing it when i was younger i again i didn't see it when it first came out but i saw it in reruns on the weekends or something uh kind of really scared me like the idea of just you know this stuff that could ooze into different places and just engulf you and consume you i found that pretty horrifying so okay. definitely something i keep in the back of my mind whenever i create you know a new slime or ooze or something which i may have done for the dungeon denizens book Ooh. so the blob 1958 we'll go with the classic awesome awesome uh my number five I debated not putting it on this list. This is probably the most non-monster movie, maybe. I don't know. Some people might think it's definitely a monster movie, but um, definitely um, on that edge there and everything. But it's such a good movie. It's probably one of my favorite movies of all time. Um, 1975, Jaws. I mean, I I think it, character, it, it counts as a monster movie. And I'm, I'm going to say Jaws for a couple of reasons here. Um, first of all, the shark was freaking scary as all get out because it's a real thing. Yes, they made it a little bit bigger than a typical great white can be, but may, you know, I, I mean, but they didn't go crazy and make it a megalodon. Um, but also the fact that the way that Spielberg, here we go, talking about Spielberg again, the way that he presented the shark, and I know that it was out of necessity because of all the failures of the 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 practical effects but mm -hmm. the fact that you didn't see the shark in separate glimpses in the beginning and all that and everything mm -hmm. and th that part worked and the music the music was yeah. amazing the fact that you could do so much between the music and the little glimpses and everything i know near the end it actually gets a little campy at the end when it's attacking mm -hmm. the ship and everything yeah but i get it um but jaws just is it's one of my favorite movies um of all time and I'm gonna say it's a monster movie for the sakes of this and everything. Um, mm -hmm. plus the the aquatic and 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 again, one of the most chilling scenes in that movie is the when uh when when Quinn talks about uh the USS Indianapolis mm -hmm. sinking and the uh, the eleven hundred men going in the water. Um that is that's horrific in my yeah. opinion, when you can tie something into something that like a shark that can really actually bite you. Mm -hmm. um you know i don't know that that's what i find is is much more horrific than say um you know whatever uh jason in manhattan <laughs> and whatever <laughs> something like that this is much much more hits closer to home so uh that's yeah. my number five debatable whether or not it's a monster movie i'd love to hear if you think it's a monster movie or not but mm -hmm. that's where i'm going all right well i i do think it's a monster movie okay yes. i don't I don't know if you could categorize it as horror or honestly what to categorize it as. You know, Jaws, it just fall, yeah. falls into weird nether region. But Jaws has always been one of my favorite movies, like actually one of my top five probably movies mm -hmm. of all time. I've enjoyed it that cool. much. Both not only for the shark itself, but just even for the character interaction, you know, the sort of uh, mixture between, you know, the three characters, the way they play off of each other is so wonderful. Um nice. And oh. and Spielberg and company basically took the better parts of the Benchley's book and frankly yeah. jettisoned a lot of the stupid subplots about like uh, the mob. mafia and infidelity and, whatever. and infidelity. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah. Definitely. So yeah, it's 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 I have nothing against Benchley. I've read many of his books, but yeah, it's it's they took the good stuff and, and ran with it. So 
and and Shade of Icarus. Anybody remember Peter Benchley's The Beast made for TV in the 90s? Uh, I do. Yes, I, I do. do. Yeah, yeah, definitely if, do. And if you if, guys if, only knew if you what smell was going ammonia, on in our head get right scared, now. scared, right? Uh, yes, yes. So anyway, so all right, that was my number yeah. five. I'm a diver, so I watched all those. Um, So where are we? All right, number four, speaking of underwater. Uh-oh. Uh, going back to 1954, I had to put at least one Universal movie on here, and here it is, <laughs> The Creature from the Black Lagoon. Nice. Always been my favorite. Nothing against, you know, The Wolfman or any of that, but I always had a soft spot for The Creature. Every single really? time he shows up on the screen, you hear that same, you know, musical notes. Music, Evidently, music again, huh? From what I, yeah. The music yeah. makes it, you know, like yeah. you, when you really think of these movies, the music is so important. Um you know, the story behind this one was like the studio executives love this sort of little mini theme they did with the creature every time he would show up. Mm -hmm. So they actually insisted that every time the creature showed up in the movie, they would play this same like couple notes. So you yep. hear the, you know, like ad nauseum in the movie, like a hundred plus times you hear this, da -da, you know, and you... but I love the creature design. I think it's so cool because it looks like something that could be swimming around under the water. To me, it looks prehistoric it you know evidently the the woman who designed it designed it on these woodcuts of uh you know early uh mythical fish creatures and things like that and that's where she got her inspiration but just such a wild cool design so yeah creature from the black lagoon gotta love it nice nice all right uh my number four we have a crossover <laughs> <laughs> the the blob oh wow. nice yeah yeah I, again this was one of those monster movies that i watched a lot when i was a kid um definitely i have not seen it in a while this is i definitely need to go dig this one up and see if it's on prime or something like that yeah um yeah 1958 steve mcqueen mm -hmm. um and again yeah oozes and black puddings i mean you really wonder if this movie didn't come out would would black puddings and oozes and stuff be a thing in in D and D, I mean, I, I mean, I'm not sure I can remember another reference to them. I mean, I, you know, there's certainly not running around in the Hobbit and Lord of the Rings, and yeah, you know, I'm not, I'm not as up on my appendix N as as other people, but I, I don't know if 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 Vance or Edgar Rice Burroughs or any of those other um, fine fine authors had you know slimes or puddings or whatnot. Mm -hmm. uh, but I mean, I just again love it, love it the the fact that it was set in uh, Pennsylvania. Uh, not too far from from where we live, and, the, and I, I didn't realize I found this out from the MST folks watching thing that there's so the the movie theater is, is still there. The Colonial Theater is oh, in Pennsylvania, nice. and since the year 2000, they do a weekend long blob fest every uh -huh. year where they reenact everybody running out of the theater. Apparently, I guess they watch the movie. I guess in the theater, and then I guess at the end they all run out onto the and they stream. That's and terrific. So yeah, Love so um, I, I had no idea, and now I'm kind of like, ooh, blob fest. I'm like, mm -hmm. I might need to do that at some point, you know, to go to that theater and everything. So. Um, but that. yeah, so that is my number four. Um, doesn't almost doesn't get more D and D than 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 puddings and slimes and oozes and everything. So <laughs> to be sure, nice. All right, I wasn't expecting that. That's a nice crossover. All right, my number three. We're going to nineteen. We're going to the nineteen eighties here. So here we All go. Right. Um, nineteen eighty two, the thing. This was okay. Yep. The John Carpenter movie, which, you know, you could say was based on, uh, you know, the 50s monster movie, which was based on Who's Goes There, which was based on Green Hell. It just goes back and back and back. Um, great movie, you know, shape-shifting creature. So whenever I think of anything, I guess it's a little bigger than, you know, Doppelganger, something that can change form. And kind of hide as somebody, you know, certainly the, the movie involved the whole paranoia, you know, is he the creature? Is he the thing? Is he the thing? Who's the thing? When did they become? The... And even as you're watching, it becomes a puzzle. You know, you're kind of mentally yeah. trying to think, well, when did the thing get to him? And when did it take over him? And how did it do it? And, and you're you're still kind of, to this day, there's like in the dark corners of the internet, there's debates going on as to, you know, who became thingified and when. Uh so it's just such a cool remake that really it stands on its own almost as a unique new movie, I think, in my mind, and, and something that didn't hit the box office by storm, but certainly became a classic, you know, a kind of cult classic as years went on. So, and talk about mind-blowing effects, and it just 
creature that's as weird as it gets and, and has all kinds of just whacked out forms. There's a scene where, you know, a head falls off of somebody and grows legs and runs away. I mean, it's crazy stuff. Yeah. So how to put the thing in here just for sheer creativity and practical effects of nothing else. Um, but again, D and D and D and D terms makes you think of those shapeshifters. So yeah. number three, the thing, yeah, lots of people loving that one in the chat. Yeah. Um, yeah, I have to admit, I never could finish this movie back in the day. This movie freaked me out too much. And I never, yep. That was like too, too much. Nope. Nope. Not doing it. Not in everything, <laughs> but I totally, I totally agree. I remember when I was digging up, you know, research for this, I was like, oh yeah. It's like, if I would have ever gotten through it, this probably would have made my list, but yeah, nope, nope, not. So, uh, move, moving on, moving on. <laughs> so, um, so my number three um, is another crossover with you. I guess I'll say it's a crossover with you. Okay. Sort of, is it? It's the Sinbad movies, uh, mm -hmm. specifically okay. the three Columbia movies: uh, fifty-eight, the Seventh Voyage; seventy-three, the Golden Voyage. That's the one I actually remember more oh, than nice. um, than actually the Seventh Voyage. I, uh -huh. I, that one was probably on more on TV more at the same time, so I, I yeah. definitely remember that one more. I actually got them kind of confused. And here's another one that I got confused that I thought was part of, this is what I was talking about, I thought was part of this trilogy. I thought Jason and the Argonauts mm -hmm. was this trilogy. And and yeah. and it confused me for many, many years that it wasn't. Mm -hmm. I, I could have swore, I'm like, ah, oh, yeah, it's like the Sinbad movies. That's the one with the Iron Golem talents yeah. in it. Well, and like, you know, nope, you had the same animator working on them. They aired on TV yep. around the same time, you know, yep. when we were kids. So I, I think that's I me too. I mentally yeah. I knew they were not part of the series, but I definitely grouped them in my mind as being yeah, they, of they that feel unit. like they could be the same. Totally, the same totally. Movie. So, yeah, so definitely I'm kind of including all of them. I mean, again, you have the um, in Golden Voice, you had the Harpy. No, wait, I'm, I'm getting them all confused. And Jason, you the Harpies. <laughs> Mm -hmm. um you had the dragon you had rocks you had all mm -hmm. just kinds of you had the skeleton fight yeah uh, um in golden voyage had the homunculus um you know and the and the uh the uh the statue with the six arms i mean Marilyn, yeah, the all over statue that one type, so type cool. five demon right there so mm -hmm. um yeah so uh they were great i mean love that animation style and everything um so uh the sinbad movies probably going with golden voyage or the seventh voyage but but with a strong nod to Jason and the Argonauts there. Mm -hmm. so, I mean, number three probably encompasses like three movies there. So. Yeah. All good though. And a lot, and that Jason, and the Argonauts skeleton fight is very beloved. So yes. Oh yes. I, I think, you know, people really look at that and, you know, that's a standout moment, you know, yep. for kind of fantasy and stop motion in general. So yeah. To be and sure it was that. really, I think kind of a, I was really in, cause you had seventh voyage was in the fifties, I believe. And Argonauts was in the sixties. So I really felt like, cause there was the one skeleton in the seventh voyage. And I really felt like it was like, well, we did one skeleton already. Mm -hmm. Now let's do six skeletons or seven skeletons, whatever the heck it is. Let's yeah. show, show them that we can do a group of skeletons and it was kind of like whoa kind of it was so the... cool the way the the effects progressed you know yes. because you know king kong was famous because uh o'brien that was the first time animation had been mixed with live action you yep. know where you had and evidently they would you know back film it and just progress it a frame at a time while he was animating and it was just this ponderous process and then, like you said, to get to the point where they got to have all these skeletons jumping around and fighting. And it's just it's crazy that they did that, you know, um, to this day, I could watch those movies and I just sit back and I'm a yep. kid again. You know, I just yep. never get old. It's one of those of I'm just clicking around and they're on. Got to stop and watch it. Yep. So. I, I might have watched one or two this week. <laughs> uh, all right. Where are we? Number two. Um I don't know. What is this? Is this science fiction? Is it suspense? Uh -oh. Is it horror? What is it? That's a big hint. Uh, Alien, 1979. Yeah, I thought you were going to uh, go there. So. Ridley Scott, fantastic directing. Love it to the point where I actually, Ridley was one of the names we considered for my son. That's how much I consider the wow. man's work and esteem. <laughs> Talk about a frightening, wild creature design. You know, uh, evidently there was a lot of different monster designs. I've seen sketches of them. And then once H.R. Uh, Giger came along with his designs, it just pretty much blew everything else out of the water. And, and they went with his to have a creature that didn't even have eyes, you know, or at least not visible eyes. Just so alien, for lack of a better term, and frightening. 
um and obviously you know born its own franchise and then you had aliens which was also a good sort of monster movie you know which fe featured a lot more of them you know maybe arguably more of an action movie uh but the first movie and the second i, I would put together love both of them both of them i think made them aliens frightening and again you when you think of a very way out of design and yet somehow makes sense you know the tongue and everything else all kind of mm -hmm. works and just little elements that are very frightening and make the creature hard to fight like having acid for blood which was so creative um i'm a big fan of the movie so yeah solid number two alien cool <clears throat> all right and yeah shade of icarus did reveal his number one favorite movie was alien and he had nice. said what his number two was earlier and i was going to ask him and he already got <laughs> to it so um moving right along because we we're pushing up against the top of the hour and we still got oh, a few yeah. more to go here so uh my number two another direct crossover with oh, you wow. probably not a huge surprise creature from the black lagoon i okay. mean uh loved it i mean i, I just that, again Kinda figured that, that yeah one of those horror movies i loved again the music the music yeah um, every time even when you just saw a hand or you saw a foot or whatever <laughs> yeah. you heard that music mm -hmm. you knew what they were doing there and and john williams did that perfectly with jaws um you know even even to fool you thinking that the shark was there mm -hmm. you know but he wasn't there so um tying that all in with the music and everything so yeah creature in the black lagoon by far my favorite i was captivated by this movie um definitely one of the more horror movies that i that i watched uh, did not realize it was originally filmed in 3D. That was the original gig. I guess 3D mm -hmm. was a thing back in the 50s. But then I apparently most people, they said, saw it in 2D, apparently, because it was only at select theaters where you could actually see it in 3D. Um, but yeah, just just phenomenal. I mean, the music, yeah. the acting, the, the practical effects with the dude in the suit, um, mm -hmm. awesome. So not too much else to say. My number two, Creature from the Black Lagoon, 1954. Nice. Yeah, I should have put that higher because I, and so much care was put into the scenes. Like if you read about it that, yeah, you know, when the diver, uh, Rico Browning, I want to say his name is, but I don't know. When they did the dive scenes even and he was stalking, you know, uh, the vi victims underwater i remember reading about they said you know the director was like well no he's got gills so we don't want to see air bubbles so they made rico hold his breath for up to four minutes at a stretch yeah. while he was in this suit underwater so you wouldn't see bubbles and you know just things like that that just you know puts it over the top all right my number one crossover okay uh 1975 jaws wow you jaws your number one yep. i see i yeah. thought alien was gonna be your number one. you so you so jaws and alien are both playing in a movie theater right across the street like, you're gonna go see jaws instead of alien i love both of them for different reasons but again okay. as a complete movie package mm -hmm. i prefer jaws wow i think wow. jaws has first off jaws has fantastic music the john yep. williams music you can't mm -hmm. beat the directing is good. Uh, again, the interplay between um, oh, Roy yeah. Scheider and the other yep. two actors, because one actor is sort of like the upper class, one plays sort of like the mm -hmm. working class, one plays like the civil servant, and they all have this weird interaction. Yeah. yeah. And it's just, you know, so cool. And you have Roy Scheider, who's the police chief, who you think would be the authority figure, who's actually not, not you know, not. he's at, completely out of his element um you know there's so much good storytelling before you even see the shark and like you said yeah. if you know the history of the movie because bruce failed so darn much yeah it made a fantastic it really started a genre not just of ocean movies but just the whole kind of genre of it's somewhere out there and we don't know where it is is what i would yeah. call the genre whether yeah. it's a cornfield or it's an ocean or or whatever oh it's it's just frightening you know i just saw open water this week that movie which was about some people getting you know left behind in a snorkeling boat and they come up and the boat's gone and they're in the middle of the ocean and it's very frightening but a lot of the fright comes from floating in this big ocean and you don't know what's around around you what's below you you know or or that kind of thing so yeah just started how many people didn't want to go in the water after that you know uh, a lot <laughs> three years <laughs> you know <laughs> so yeah absolute solid star wow. number one joy is shocked yeah. wow i am absolutely stunned absolutely stunned i knew it and i and when you said alien number two i was kind of like wow what the heck could be number one <laughs> and i'm like 
But wow, that is, I am absolutely stunned. That I that am a big fan. One. So wow. yeah, I did not, I did not know that. I mean, yeah, it's, it's in my, definitely my favorite horror ish movie um, yeah. slash monster movie. Uh, definitely probably in my top five movies. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's yeah, such mean, a great movie. I, I wish the sequels didn't precipitately fall off the yeah. cliff as quick as they did, but, but you know, for the, for a first entry, oh my goodness, what a good movie. So yeah. All right. Um, well, my again, number frightening monster, monster driven movie. Yeah. So yeah, you know. yeah. My number one, a little bit surprised that has not been mentioned actually. So I'm going back to 1981 and Clash of the Titans. I Ooh, mean, okay. Clash yes, of the yeah. Titans. I mean, Kraken, Medusa, Pegasus, mm -hmm. Rock, Hags, um, yep. giant scorpions. And I will say, what is better than giant scorpions? The 2010 version that has giant scorpions the size of a freaking house. Um, I mean, those giant scorpions are amazing. Um, and I mean, and and you know, I know that the the 2010 movie is is not a great movie and everything, but there are some scenes that are really good. The Medusa scene is awesome, but the Medusa scene in the original movie, oh, yeah. is amazing. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah. That's that part of the movie, scene, I think. The way they use shadows and, yep. you know, it's funny. It's ironic because I hear this all the time. TV shows now use darkness to kind of cover up a lot of stuff where you can't see action scenes and stuff. And and you see a lot of pushback online about, you know, filming in dark, gloomy areas where you really can't see what's going on. And it hides a lot of things and everything. They didn't. I mean, there was a lot of things hidden in that Medusa scene, that original Medusa scene. But it was the lighting was just so perfect. The way they mm -hmm. used the lighting and the shadows yeah. was just amazing. It was very interesting that the 2010 remake didn't go shadowy with the Medusa scene. It was brightly lit. Yep. And you saw everything. And I know the computer can you can fix a lot of mistakes and everything like that. But I'll, I'll argue that um, that Clash of the Titans for my bang of the buck. I watched this mm -hmm. movie when it hit HBO over and over and over <laughs> and over again. Um, I mean, it was it was my D and D movie basically mm -hmm. back then. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was like it just it had everything. It had a vorpal sword. It had the uh, the invisibility helmet. It had the you know the magic. Sh it just it just had everything. Um, and and Bubo the owl. I mean, we can't forget the <laughs> little mechanical owl. Um, so anyway, I really love this one. The music again, mm -hmm. love the music. Um, truly love the music of the remake 2010 i do not understand why i like the music so much on the 2010 remake um mm -hmm. but there's some movies that you know i don't even like the movie but i like the soundtrack and um you know clash of the titans 2010 is probably one of my all-time favorite soundtracks believe it or not um mm -hmm. and uh and it's by the guy who did the game of thrones music i believe if i'm getting that right so um mm -hmm. before he did game of thrones i believe or maybe it was around the same time but yeah, oh, just Clash of the Titans. Shocked you did not put it on your list. It's right in there with the Sinbads and, mm -hmm. it is. and the Argonauts. It is. And it's just, again, it feels like the same movie because, you know, Ray yeah. Harryhausen did all the effects and everything. But um, but my, definitely my D&D movie back nice. from the early 80s. I so. think that's part of it. I, I kind of, like Jason, the Argonauts, I think mentally I kind of lumped that in with the Sinbad yeah. movie. So I kind I of that. put Golden Voyage up there as my representation of yeah. But yeah, I enjoyed this movie too. Um All right. So that is our top 10 um uh, movie favorite monster movies uh, on like I said a little bit of a different show here and yes somebody mm -hmm. mentioned it. Yeah, it's be not it, you would have thought we would have planned this because of the Oscars, but no, we we didn't actually. <laughs> it was really more we wanted to do something monster adjacent with uh the Kickstarter going on so we could kind of talk about that a little bit. Um Rick, what do you got to say as far as uh giving folks the rundown on the sure uh well first off folks we're thrilled you could join us for this special show we're, we had a lot of fun with this um if you liked what you saw give us a follow give us a like if you're watching this later on youtube and you haven't already please subscribe it helps us and keep those comments coming our next show kind of going back to the norm will be coming to you on april 2nd at 8 p.m and we're going to be picking up where we left off in the Long Giant and uh, Underdark series. And we're going to be going right back in and picking up with Descent into the Depths of the Earth. The good old classic D1 adventure will be picking up on April 2nd. So I hope you can join us. Awesome. And to wrap up the show, we're going to zip through our pearls of wisdom. Um, I'll jump in first mm -hmm. since you just finished up with that. Uh, I, I, here's my pearl. It's short and sweet, simple this week. 
um go watch some of these classic movies um you know a lot of them are available on prime um or you know whatever your streaming service of choices a lot of them are on there um or you can rent them somehow and everything um they're just you know some of these movies just bring back awesome nostalgia um Mm -hmm. go for it you know and and rediscover some of these old classics even from like the 50s and 60s i know i'm gonna try and track down the blob and watch the blob again because i'd forgotten Mm -hmm a lot about that movie until I was starting to put this list together. I'm like, I've honestly not seen that movie in 20 or 30 years and I really need to revisit it. So, um, so that's my own. Go, go out, watch some cool movies. (laughs) (laughs) Riffing on that. Mine's very similar. Yeah. Go movies like this are such great inspiration for D and D creature design and just D and D adventure design. So, you know, go out, watch some of these movies we've mentioned if you haven't for some reason already, you know, and just go out and see movies because I, I think of movie scenes when I'm writing adventures, you know. And if you see a cool monster in a movie, think about why it's cool. What When you're seeing a monster on the screen, think to yourself, what is, is scaring me about this monster? What's making this monster unique or memorable to me? And then try to take that to your table, you know, try to imagine that monster with player characters and how they would interact and, and, and carry that over to your table. And, and, you know, you can't go wrong. Nice, nice. Yes, the history professor. Go on a date, kids. Date night, date night. <laughs> there you go. All right. So we will wrap that up a little bit. Went a little bit long, but that's okay. Um, it was fun content. Hopefully there's not a show waiting to start after us. Um, <laughs> but uh, everybody have a great next couple of weeks. Um, hopefully we'll see you guys out at um, GaryCon. Come track us down. Um, and with that, we will say have a good night and see you in three weeks. Good night, folks. <laughs>